Hey, hey, hey! What's up, everybody? I hope you are doing well. Wait a minute, what's that noise? Back again. Welcome to another episode of Ask the Dietitian. We are waiting for none other than Professor Lindsay Howard to jump in. She's just finishing up a meeting herself, and she'll jump right back on here with us. I wanted to say hello to everybody and welcome back to Monday. Now, as we say, Monday starts on Sunday. And what do I mean by that? Let me briefly explain this. Your Monday starts on Sunday, which means you must plan for Monday. You must plan your success, plan your action steps on Sunday. So when Monday hits, you're already at a sprint. You don't slowly creep and crawl and climb out of bed and and, and try and figure out what you're going to do come Monday. You're too late if that's the case. So I want to make sure as we kick this off, you're thinking about goals, you're forward thinking, and, and I appreciate, leave the comments um, in, in the comment section. You guys want to ask questions, leave them here for the Dolce Dietitian. Lindsay's hopping on right now, and actually, I think I see her chiming in. So let's bring on Lindsay. Hey, there she is. What's up, Lindsay? What's up? How are you, Professor? Pretty good. How about you? Wonderful. Thank you. And I appreciate you getting jumping in. I know that you've been busy. So thank you. Of You're course. You're welcome. Here and for prioritizing us. Good. Have you been going for a while? Uh, no, we just, just got on, just kicked off. And I was talking about how it's important to plan and how mm -hmm. Monday really starts on Sunday or a successful week starts with the planning. And this is something that we covered with the DDC coaching our, our coaches this weekend. We spoke about the importance of planning and of action steps. And there's a little bit of feedback in the background. Do you have a something else running? Hmm, let's uh, let me check. check. All right, all right, all right. So, and that was the concept as we lead into this and people are now leaving comments and thank you for the comments. We're going to be jumping into a few of these, but really as we start off and what we were supposed to do last week, but we got caught up in conversations about the education system and I forgot to stay on track and talk about stubborn body fat. And that's an area I think maybe we'll talk about right now. We'll get into stubborn body fat strategies and we'll kind of build that out as we continue on. We also want to briefly talk about that MMA weight cut we all saw um, recently, which was horrific. And we'll speak briefly to that also. And guys and gals, keep leaving your comments. Keep asking your questions um, in the chat. We will jump in there in, in a few minutes and we'll start to answer. So when we talk about stubborn body fat, there's a few reasons why body fat is considered to be stubborn. Many people think they have stubborn body fat areas when they simply eat like an idiot. They don't diet, they don't exercise, they don't get good sleep, they don't manage their stress, and then they point to their love handles or their little you know, pooch over their, uh, under their belly button, and they say, oh, I have stubborn body fat. Well, that's not the case. The issue really is, is lifestyle. In order to understand stubborn body fat, we actually have to be living a lifestyle that is maximizing natural fat loss or it's optimizing your ideal body composition. And that's not bikini bodybuilder stage ready per se, right? That's that's exceptional. So as I get off and kind of, you know, hand it over to you, Lindsay, do you have any certain definition or, or you know, description of what we would consider stubborn body fat areas? Yeah. So, I mean, it's usually what we think of when, is there an echo? Not anymore. No. Okay. Um, there is slightly when I speak, I can hear at the tail end, um, okay. but not when you're speaking. Okay. Um, no. Uh-oh. Poof. 
And there she goes. Lindsay, we have this circle of doom. All right, so Lindsay's a little bit of technical difficulties there at the science lab. So all the diagnostic tools that are around here and uh, getting a, a proper Wi-Fi connection is sometimes a challenge. So she'll ring back in here in a moment. But as we talk about stubborn body fat, guys and gals, this is what I want you to think about. Now, here we are. It's March 22nd. Summer is almost upon us. Skin season, as I like to call it, is almost here. Do not get it twisted. Do not pretend it's not happening. Do not sit there in your sweater and your jacket and act like it's not summertime yet. Skin season is here. You must start your recomposition program now, your body transformation program now. If you're interested in a curated approach, a personalized approach, an online weight loss program, working one-on-one -on -one with myself and Lindsay, one of us, all of us, click the links below this video. We have a bunch of great tools and opportunities for you down below this video. Scroll down, click the link, see what's there. We can certainly help you personally. But most importantly, I want you to understand you must take accountability right now to get that summer body, to get ready for summer. You must start now. And it doesn't have to be a Herculean effort, right? You don't have to, you know, be doing the assault bike and, and, and eating two ounces of, of boiled chicken breast. No, hell no. We never suggest that. I don't want you to do that. I want you to enjoy the process, to love the process, to fall in love with the process. So then you never quit. You never stop. You start recomping your body now. You transform your body now. You go through summer. You have the best summer of your life right now. Welcome back, Lindsay. I'm ranting on summer right now. You have the best summer of your life right now. And then it bleeds into fall and you keep doing it. And then in the fall time, you look better than summertime. Winter time, you look better than fall. Spring of next year, you actually look better than the peak of summer last year. And this is how it happens. So we're saying, I just want you hitting base hits all day long, making slightly better choices today than yesterday. And we are going to provide you evidence-based scientific strategies in order to do that in a manner that suits your lifestyle, suits your personality, suits your goals, that washes away all of the BS, all of the intermittent fasting, all of the keto, all of the, the car blocker pills and the waist trimmers, all the fad stuff that doesn't work. Everything I just said clearly doesn't work because it's been there for years and years and years. And when you look around your household, you look around your peer group, you look around your office, you still see fat bodies. It didn't work, right? How much money did the people around you spend? How much time did they waste jumping from fad diet to fad diet to fad diet for what? To lose a few pounds in the beginning and then gain it all back plus a few weeks later? That, that is the age old story, the E true Hollywood story for, for anyone who recalls that. That's what it is. So what, what Professor Howard and I are going to do right now is we're going to briefly define stubborn body fat and we're going to help you build a lifestyle to dramatically reduce total body fat. And then we will get into the niche area of stubborn body fat. So Lindsay, welcome back. Thank you. I said you're in this beautiful scientific lab and we cannot get the Wi-Fi to work for some reason. <sighs> <laughs> I even switched right. I went right to desktop today because the, yeah. the, the Wi-Fi with my lap, my Mac was not working the last couple of weeks. And I don't even know what that was. I was sitting here talking. You and when, oh, and then just like you got the circle of doom as we all see in the, the Xbox PlayStation world. And then it just screen, poof, it disappeared. Yeah. My screen went black, but I just kept talking. And then I was like, hello. <laughs> and I'm sure what you said was brilliant, by the way. <laughs> So if you could, again, just briefly give an overview of the difference between stubborn body fat, true stubborn body fat, and then just, you know, excess body fat that we all have from time to time. Right. Yeah. So I don't know how much of how much of what I said actually was seen zero. and heard. But uh, literally zero. Nothing came through. Oh, fantastic. So I'll just start from the beginning. Um, but when we think of body fat, I mean, it's it's definitely there's definitely a genetic component. Um, just looking at difference between differences between males and females, males and females tend to store their body fat in different places. 
um, you know, so like females, like backs, backs of the arms, um, you know, lower belly in the hips, the love handles, those areas, men get some extra body fat, like in their pec area, things like that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, mine, the boobs, typically, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. I like, I, you know, I talk about it, you know, chronically my like love handle, like outer hip fat, yeah. that's the last place first on last off for me yeah. chronically. I'll be shredded in vascular. My thighs, my upper body, that's that last little pocket. And that is right. that is a true stubborn genetic. Because when I look at on my, my maternal side, so many bodies that we all have that. And yeah. I believe it's due to insulin issues. But continue on, Lindsay. Apologies. Yeah. yeah. And it's different for other people. Like I have I have friends who, you know, psych, like cyclically diet and, uh, you know, really pay attention to what they're doing in the gym and things like that. And the very first thing you notice is their face. So like some people could get could gain a lot of weight, um, you know, put on a lot of body fat, but their face looks the same. Whereas other people, they put body fat on, on their face. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on the person. And you, you know, like if you've ever been through, you know, like say like a bulking season when you put a little bit more body fat on and then you go to take it off, it's like the first place you see it being added to and the very last place you can get it off. Um, so that, that would be your individual uh, stubborn body fat area. And that's why we talk about doing lists all the time, um, because there's only so much that just regular, you know, of, of course, you need to be completely adherent to your nutrition program, be very intentional in the gym. Um, you know, you get a lot of questions like, well, if I do a bunch of tricep extensions, then my, my fat on the up, uh, back of my arm is going to go away. Not the case. So we know you can't spot reduce fat, um, but we can do low intensity, steady state. <clears throat> cardiovascular exercise, we could, which could be as simple as walking um, in a fasted state to help target some of that, that uh, stubborn body fat area. So what we do there is just pretty much enhance lipolysis or the breakdown of fat um, in excess of what we could possibly do in a fed state. Um, you know, so suppressing insulin, allowing for that, you know, thermogenic effect to kick in to hopefully target those, those body fat areas. Um, I think a couple areas that people miss out on is like, they're doing everything right with nutrition, everything right with exercise, but their sleep schedule is like horrible. Maybe they're stressed out all the time. So we have to think of hormonal things too. Cortisol is huge. Um, you know, if you're stressed out, if you have like all this ang anxiety and things like that, cortisol is going to be high, which inhibits your ability to lose body fat. So there's kind of other couple other factors that we consider when we get down to that, you know, you just have a few pounds of that extra body fat to, to uh, peel off. You know, that's an interesting point I want to briefly touch on right now. And and in the the general the, the white belt fitness community, you have guys like Greg Doucet, who's a very popular YouTuber, but he's a white belt with regards to true nutrition understanding. And he talks about calorie in, calorie out diet. And he recommends very low net nutrient meal plans, lots of synthetic toxic chemicals, artificial foods, artificial sweeteners, and such. And I, I, Greg and I have had a little bit of, of back and forth. Unfortunately, I don't dislike the guy. And I say that all the time. I like to see people successful. That's fine. But he's much more of a steroid coach, much more of a, a drug coach. And hey, that's fine, whatever but not at all a nutrition coach. And he gives very dangerous information, bad information out there where he teaches, and he has a large platform now, a million some odd subscribers on YouTube, and he teaches his community to consume synthetic toxic chemicals with no regard for the metabolic impact or the physiological impact of those synthetic toxic chemicals, those harmful ingredients. And as you said, the biochemical connection to targeted fat loss, strategic fat loss, to the ability to build muscle or even systemic inflammation. This is something that of course, you know, we know here and many of those who are, I think above the purple belt level as I kind of brand people inside the nutrition world, we understand the, the physiological impact of specific food types or food-like substances and what the overall outcome will be. And I again point to our stable of, of elite world-class drug-tested athletes that look like bodybuilders and get that single digit low level body fat percentage, maintain maximum amounts of muscle. So with regards to recomposition programs, 
gender specific stubborn body fat strategies like, uh, you know, reduction strategies. Well, well, we can certainly point to that. And I'm pointing to this young man right here, Mirsad Bektik, who in that photo is, is hovering right around 5.8% body fat, weighing 146 pounds, who normally walks around somewhere between 172 and 174, extremely lean even at that body weight. So I use that real world example as we push on. To the bad information that's out there that you and I are constantly battling against. And those listening right now and, and, and taking part, you can understand this isn't calories in, calories out. Calories only matter at the end of the equation once we've totaled up all the high net nutrient foods. And that's really where this equation starts. And you had mentioned cortisol, which, which of course sprung my brain over to the, the, the biochemical response to food, but also to stress, external levels of stress matters. And I only say this before I hand the microphone back. If we have two twins who eat relatively the same foods, but one twin is chronically stressed out, they're going through a massive divorce, their home's being foreclosed on, they're about to get fired at their job, their brakes are about to go out and on their vehicle. Um, you know, just like the word, their neighbors is always calling the HOA on them. Like the worst of the worst is, is going on and they're only sleeping five or six hours per night. They're, they're training, they're going to the gym at the same time per day, they're training partners and they eat the same foods. We understand emphatically that the twin without all of those lifestyle obstructions will have a much, much greater net benefit with regards to lean muscle mass growth and enhancement, the reduction of total body fat, gender specific, stubborn body fat, of course. It, it's, it's night and day. Well, all things, it, but they eat the same amount of calories and they, they have the same workout program. That's where most of the white belt YouTube fitness bodybuilding bro template coaches, that's all they speak about. That's why we say, hey, calories in, calories out. That's such a, 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 a small part of the equation. There's all this other stuff that we have to sp focus on first. If we don't focus on this, it doesn't matter how many calories you consume, especially if they're synthetic toxic chemicals or low, let, low net nutrient um, food substances. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this morning, I was getting some grading done and kind of just walking around the lab here um, before a meeting that I had. And there's like six trash cans in here because, you know, they like generate a lot of trash, like whether whatever kind of lab we're doing, uh, band-aids, stuff like that. So I threw some gloves on and I figured this would be a good show and tell for today. Threw some gloves on and peeled a few items out of the trash, which are my students' beverages. So we've got Pepsi Zero Sugar, Ugh. one, Gatorade Zero, and we've got, of course, boom, and I'm like, three of the trash cans have already been emptied, and I'm like, this is just from a week of stuff, um, but what I'm getting at is just a quick look at the ingredient list on this, so zero calories, so a lot of people who are on this calorie-restricted diet yeah. are like, boom. Pepsi Zero, I can have this, no calories. But what they're missing is all the crap that's in there. Like it's it's just bad. Um, the Gatorade Zero, because I, I know you talked about this on your uh, diet pills video, drinking a neon neon beverage. Um, but sucralose, so artificial sweeteners. The Starbucks can is 210 calories, just in this one can drink. Um, and same thing, sucralose. Um, so what and I'm getting at, I is just want to point right here. I'm drinking a, a iced coffee, nice. zero calories, by the way. True. So, but, but from the earth, from, yeah, right from actual coffee beans yes. ground in front of me with a little bit of, of ice cubes, which is just frozen water, by the way. Right. Boom. <laughs> yes. Um, but no, so people, especially on these, you know, calorie restrictive diets, consume all these low calorie or no calorie foods. And they're like, it's not going to affect me because there's no calories. So how could I possibly gain weight from eating these zero calorie beverages? But there's clear, clear research and literature that exists that pretty much states like we have different transporters in our body. So obviously we know insulin takes glucose and puts it away for storage, but we also have more specific transporters. One of them is called GLUT4, so G-L-U-T-4, that is responsible for taking glucose 
And really its main reason is to bring glucose into the muscle cell so that you could generate energy for activity. But if you bring too much, if those glute fours are overactive, so to speak, they become overstimulated and they do become overstimulated when we consume a lot of these uh, artificial sweeteners. So what they're doing is bringing glucose into the cells that already have too much and they're storing that or promoting the storage of fat. So although these, these products don't have any calories in them, they're essentially promoting the storage of extra fat. Um, so just, just stay away. This, uh, this is going where back guys, the this is where guys like Greg Doucette are epic failures with regards to nutrition education. Clearly, he does not understand exactly what you just said. And this is like, that should be base entry level knowledge for anyone who provides nutrition education. And it's so disturbing to hear guys and gals like Greg put such bad information into the world and then try and monetize it by supporting it with pseudoscience and fallacies that are propped up through excessive drug abuse. So you get these, these steroid abusers, these drug abusers that look great in their own right, and then they put horrible, dangerous information into the population and they sell it to the naive user who just wants to look like Greg. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the drug stack that makes him look that way. And it's the drug stack that battles against much of the, the physiological reactions that you're mentioning right now. Yeah. So, and you know, in time, of course, that's untenable, not sustainable. And then when they come off the drugs, we clearly see what winds up happening. And usually five, 10, 15 years or later or so, we can see just terrible, deleterious health effects as a result of that, that abuse kind of burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. So, you know, and again, this is free. I know there's, there's Greg fans out here and Hey, that's fine. You know, I hope wish them all the well, but at the same time, the nutrition information is horrible. There, there, there's horrible. And, and it, it, it's bothering of course, because there's a bunch of young kids out there who follow it, who don't understand the, just the base signs that, that you're sharing right now. And I mean, you're just, you know, making it very easy to understand for those watching. It's, this is a serious issue. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. And it's like, that should be like your one of the first places you start. Um, we're doing a, the gym that I have, you know, per, like personal training clients at right now. We're doing like a group kind of like a six week weight loss challenge type thing. And every week they get, you know, like a fitness challenge. Like this week is like to complete an extra like eight miles over the course of the week. You know, go for a two mile walk today, whatever. And the nutrition challenge, which I come up with for this week was to go in your pantry or your fridge and find three products that have, and I think I listed like the five, the five biggest artificial sweeteners. So like sucralose, uh, aspartame, you know, the big ones. Yeah. And I put like step one, find them. Step two, take a picture of them and post them. We have like a private Facebook group um, to post a picture. Step three, throw that shit out. Ha. So, but it's, it's important for them to kind of share with each other because it could be like your yogurt that you eat every single morning. And you're like, oh, shit, I didn't know this was in there. Yeah. Um, so it's important, you know, something that you think is generally safe and generally uh, healthy or nutritious because that's how it's marketed. Uh, think of Gatorade. Gatorade is like you see the top the world's top athletes on Gatorade commercials. So people are like, oh, Gatorade, that must be great for me. Um, but there's there's so many hidden ingredients and dyes and artificial sugar sugars and things like that. So I think that's a easy place to start. With Gatorade and with those type of products, I always ask people, question number one, why is it neon? <laughs> if this is a, a health supplement, why is it neon? What healthful nutrient is making this neon green, neon red, neon blue colors that I've actually never seen before are now showing up in these health drinks and these health supplements and these RTDs and such ready to drinks, you know, why is it neon? Mm -hmm. Question number one, wait, rule number one is do no harm. Therefore, question number one, why is that neon? <laughs> Does that have a healthful effect inside my body? 
What's the answer? No, of course not. And then all the flavor additives. Why are there so many synthetic toxic chemicals inside this healthful product? And as we keep asking that question, we realize these are just commercial commodities. These are just for sale units. These are just sprockets meant to be marketed and packaged and and manufactured at a price point low enough to generate maximum profits to the board and shareholders inside a company. These are not meant to be healthy. These are meant to be profitable. And then we'll you know, use some healthy uh, bullet points to market them, to generate more profits. Mm-hmm. So when you look at these, and it, it's so simple, every supplement you have, spin around that whey protein. In my world, when I, I look at a, a health supplement, a sports supplement, I spin it around, I read the ingredients. I can tell if the company actually cares about your health and fitness or if they only care about their margin. If I see any synthetic toxic chemicals, artificial sweeteners in there, I know 100% they are simply squeezing you, the consumer, to make more money. It is not that much more expensive to use all natural sweetening ingredients than artificial sweetening. Now, the artificial sweeteners are less expensive. It is slightly more expensive to use truly natural sweetening agents. It's slightly more expensive, so they don't use it. They're trying to squeeze a third of a penny of profit off of you by feeding you synthetic toxic chemicals. That is my opinion, and I think it's validated through science. That's, and I know company owners, and I've sat on, on boards and had meetings and, and you know, gone through multiple manufacturing and distribution plants and talked to the head of, of, of formulations, and I'm, I'm pretty well versed in this. It's all about profit. You yep. can actually sell a profitable product that also takes into consideration the, the, the health of the end user and only provides the highest quality nutrients. So it's something to be aware of. And then I will point to the disruption in the end user's uh, response to that. So when you're trying to lose weight and look better and feel better, but you're consuming these artificial sweeteners that are adversely affecting your microbiome, causing systemic inflammation, you will feel worse. You will not achieve the goals you're looking for. And in very, quite possibly, you will manifest a myriad of health issues as a result of that, though it's, quote, low cow. But that's just a marketing scheme. So I'm, I'm you know, going round and round and round on, on that concept again. But I just yeah. want to make, you know, make it a point. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it would be a wake up call if, if, if people Googled. And we've talked about this before, but the, the grass items. So generally recognized as safe. Yeah. These are like common items. But generally. Would you really want to eat something that's generally recognized as safe? Yeah. Like some research says, you know, it could be pretty harmful to you, but some says Meh, it might be okay. But by the government standards, it's deemed, you know, generally recognized as safe. It's not and deemed safe. <laughs> no, it's not. It's generally recognized as safe. And usually it's generally recognized as safe in the dose that was studied. Right. So then it's general, but how many people drink double and triple the amount of soda that was generally recognized as safe while they're eating a bag of chips that has the same ingredient and they're eating two or three times that and they have their candy earlier and their crappy cereal for breakfast. So the totality of their day destroys the equation of generally recognized as safe. And even that wasn't absolute. Yeah, exactly. It's... It's pretty eye-opening for sure. All right. Now, let, now brass tacks here. Let, let, let's kind of drill this back down and let's talk about what would be the ideal day for those watching right now to reduce body fat and then start to attack the stubborn body fat. So they have a great summer. They look awesome. Fall, they're even better. This time next year, they're a completely new person, like, like reversing the aging process in many ways. What would you say is, is just take us through what would the, the average day look like and just touch on some exercise, touch on some food? Okay. So, boom, alarm goes off, wake up, have some water, go to the bathroom, do whatever you want to do. If you're a coffee drinker, 
have some black coffee. Um, you know, if you're a tea drinker, have some black tea. Uh, hit your lists. So in most places that have all four seasons, it's starting to warm up. Thank goodness. So go outside and go for a walk. 30, 45 minutes is all it takes. At least 30 minutes, no more than 60 minutes-ish. Go for your walk. Have some breakfast. Um, you know, more specifically, make sure you're having a, a high quality protein source, some vegetables, uh, maybe a carbohydrate source since you just walked for 60 minutes. Uh, most people go to work. So go to work. All right. It's not that difficult to make sure that you're getting in bed at an appropriate time so that you could wake up with enough time to do all that stuff that I just mentioned. Um, so you go to work, make sure we're continuously drinking water throughout the day um, and be intentional about it. Don't just be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, sip on some water. Keep going. Do, you have, do you have your bro jug? I do. <laughs> um, be intentional about your water intake. So pay attention. You know, if your your container is a liter, <laughs> there it is. This is like number four <laughs> since last time you made fun of me, by the way, two yes. days ago. <laughs> um, you know, if, you're, if your water bottle, hydro flask, whatever it may be, is like a liter um, or slightly less than a liter, count it. Make sure you know how much water you took in. Um, we usually recommend at least a gallon. That's like the minimum, at least a gallon, probably closer to two gallons for people who are exercising strenuously um, and maybe are of a larger size. Okay. So you go through your day, you leave work, then maybe after work, you're hitting a, a higher intensity type workout. So maybe that's resistance training. Maybe you're going to like a boot camp class. Maybe you're going to MMA training, um, whatever it is, um, circuit training, go for a run something of a higher intensity where your heart rate's up, you're really sweating, you're huffing and puffing, you know, getting a good output. And then I kind of skipped over this part, but making sure that we're eating something every two to three hours um, just to keep the kind of the engine running, keep the, keep the system going, making sure that there's no point where you're like, Oh my God, I have not eaten in so long. I'm so hungry. Um, and then also when you're eating, making sure that we're not getting to the point where you feel like sickening full so you just want to feel satisfied from your meal. You don't want to feel huge and bloated and all that stuff. Um, so after that higher intensity uh, exercise bout, whatever that looks like for you, whatever you enjoy doing, you want to make sure that we are refueling after that. Okay, so making sure we have, if you did something more cardiovascular, making sure you're def definitely getting enough uh, carbohydrate to restore the glycogen that you just burned and lost, and then continue to drink that water. Um, we want to make sure that you're not eating a huge meal directly before you go to bed because it could negatively affect the quality of your sleep. Um, so making sure you, you leave some time to do whatever it is. Sometimes I recommend people go for a sh very short walk after dinner um, just to help kind of digest and all that stuff uh, before bed. But then making sure you're getting probably at least eight hours, ideally, you know, nine hours of rest, but eight hours of def definite sleep. And then you get up and do it all over again. You know, and that day right there is very easy for every person to follow with a little bit of intent. Yep. Right. It's so easy to default back to the lazy old you or fat you, as I like to say, trying to be, um, you know, PC maybe or not. But it's really like it's like unhealthy you versus healthy you. And Maybe you don't do everything Lindsay just said today, but you wake up and you go for a walk today. And then, you know, maybe you only have two or three meals. Okay, we'll, we'll get another one in. You're going to get some grocery shopping done this weekend. You're going to be more mindful. Well, maybe you don't get that, that late night workout or the late afternoon workout in every day, but you get it once or twice. Maybe you just go for a second walk or you, you pop in a quick 20-minute yoga video in your bedroom, whatever's going on. The point is we scale to it. You, you, you know you have a goal. You slowly start to build to it and you start implementing. What Lindsay just said here, guys, is so easy to follow. And most people that we speak with through our consultations, they don't follow this, this basic lifestyle yet. This is something – this is free, free for you guys, free right now. Just start to implement this type of lifestyle, this type of program. And watch how dramatic the change is in your life, right? We're not talking about, you know, counting calories at all. We're not talking about what percent of your one rep max you should be training with later on in the day. You'll get there eventually. 
But damn, if you're not waking up and moving your body in an athletic fashion for 30 to 45 minutes, staying well hydrated, eating at you know high quality foods at even intervals throughout the day, if you're not doing that yet, getting eight hours of solid sleep per night, if you're not doing that yet, percentage of one RM doesn't matter. Like all that, the minutia, all the little stuff doesn't matter. And most people, they focus on the things that don't matter almost as a barrier to entry on purpose. So, so they can blame the shit. Oh, my diet didn't work. Like whatever that they'll blame the one stupid little thing. Meanwhile, they're playing Fortnite until 1 AM when they have to wake up at six to get to work. So then they hit the snooze until 6 30. Then they leave the house without breakfast. They stop at the little drive through Dunkin Donuts and they get the crappy light and sweet coffee and a donut on the way. And, and then the, the cascade of failure, you know, just kind of continues on. So I agree with that, Lindsay, you, you're, you're completely accurate. Now, guys and gals, I just threw into the chat also below this video to text me, text me 732-487-3445, the word YouTube, text me the word YouTube, and I will put you onto a notification list. Well, you, you'll get text when we're about to go live with these videos because the YouTube algorithm has been not quite um, accurate lately. But also we're going to ask you to like, hey, be a part of some of these videos down the road, which will be cool. And then there's going to be some free giveaways also down the road. So feel free. If you're interested, just just throw that out there. Now, I wanted to go through. There's a lot of questions here, Lindsay, and, and let's run through this. Let, let's jump in and, and answer some questions. Sounds good. Awesome. All right. Bradley, what's up, Bradley? Good to see you. Yo, 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 Jamie Whitman. What's up, Jamie? Good to see you, young lady. Jamie Whitman, a Dolce Diet certified coach, by the way, one of the OGs. Russell Garcia. Coach, I've been having weird gas and my digestion has been off. I want to ask my doctor for blood work. What should I specifically ask for? I don't. Is there any blood work that would kind of help a doctor determine some, some gastro issues? I'm not really sure of any. Yeah, I, I mean, aside from just a normal blood panel, maybe some inflammatory markers, um, you know, if you, if you think that you had specific food insensitivities, um, I don't think blood work is a bad idea, but yeah. I also would recommend figuring out which foods are triggering this. Um, and then you could do that simply just by, you know, jotting down some notes after you eat certain types of foods. Um, how do I feel right after I eat this this particular meal? How do I feel a couple hours later? Yeah. Um, you don't even have to write it down as long as you, you know, have it in your mind. But no, I, specific blood work. Yeah, sure. I, I agree. There, there, there's not to, to what I'm aware of. I don't know of any specific blood work, but definitely go to your doctor. Definitely discuss it with your doctor. You probably get referred out to a, a, a gastro or gastroenterologist is that is that the, the right way to say it what is it gastroenterologist <laughs> yes gastroenterologist um so cool russ all right ethan your videos have been helping me a lot and i just want to say thank you ethan thank you and if anyone does like these videos just give us a thumbs up engage with the content for the algorithm we appreciate you guys being here king says i'm currently following the book version of three weeks of shredded if i switch to the online program what could I expect being different? Thanks for the wonderful content you provide us. Awesome. Well, number one, thank you for trusting us with the book version of Three Weeks to Shredded, which actually is right here. Bam. How about that? Now, the online version is like a 4D version where you don't have to do any of the calculations you do in the book. The online version builds you the most ideal program for you, for your background, for your lifestyle, for your current body weight, for your training history, your forward moving goals. Our sophisticated algorithm and rule engine builds you the ideal plan. Plus you have the ability to make substitutions. We have a database of over 200 additional recipes. We have a complete workout program suited to your goals that's in there with 200 additional exercises that can be substituted in and out. We have leaderboards so you can see where you fall in regards to anyone else in the planet using the platform or maybe just in your country or maybe your age or maybe your gender or maybe on, on a specific exercise if they're putting in because we have a training journal also and you update your training journal and it'll say like, hey, 
you know, say like Mike's best deadlift was on this day and, and, you know, a percentage of my body weight. So you can compete or see where you fall with people. There's a lot of content in the online platform and also members of the online platform. Once you go through the four 12 weeks of your program, you roll into a monthly membership plan for $9, nine dollars nine ninety nine. Cancel at any time. No charge. You can cancel immediately. That's fine. And that allows you to continue using any of the programs that we have. So for no additional charge. So you can do another four weeks or three weeks of shredded at your new body weight, no additional charge or living lean, no additional charge. We have a new body weight program coming out soon. No additional charge. When squats and steak launches, that'll be in there. No additional charge. A lot of people use that. Plus it gives you access to our private Facebook group, which is exclusively reserved to members of the online community. That is a support group. It's a cheerleader group. It's, it's a, you know, like a, a diet hacking group in a way of, you know, where do you shop and what do you buy and how do you cook your recipe? And, and this is my, you know, high five and, you know, for your, your progress. It, it's a very close knit global community. So that would be what you get King Brian. You can click the link below and even get an additional 25% discount with promo code transform. It's especially summer's coming right now. So we are there for you. Russ. Yep. Yep. Russ got it. What's up, Joe? Good to see you. Dave Mack. Happy Monday, Uncle Mike and Professor Lindsay. Creatine question. What should the cycle look like on versus off? You have suggestions, Linz? Um, I personally am not a creatine user. Um, so I don't have any personal experience as far as the a loading schedule. And I really don't have a lot of clients that, that use it quite okay. frequently. So Mike, you might be better at answering this question. Is that because um, of my bro jug? Is that, yes, that, that's right. Exactly. All right. Gave it away. So back a little bit of, of, of backstory here. Back in the 90s or so, I was working at a, a national health food store chain. And that was when EAS, the company, was launched by Bill Phillips, who then launched Muscle Media 2000. And Bill Phillips was the innovator of creatine monohydrate. He's the one that turned it into what it is right now. And when Bill Phillips launched creatine monohydrate, he said, you must take five, five grams per dose five times per day for the first five days. Well, wouldn't you know it? That was almost exactly what was in one tub of Bill's EAS creatine monohydrate. And then you would take one to two scoops per day each day thereafter. So that meant I was going to have to buy two and probably three tubs of creatine monohydrate from Bill Phillips EAS in order to get the gains I so desperately wanted. And that's what we all did. And then in time, a decade or so later, we realized, you know what? We don't need that much. There's an accumulation phase of creatine monohydrate, and you only need to take about three to five grams per day once per day for most people, and you will still have that nearly same net effect in accumulation over a, a five to 15 day period or so. So I have used creatine monohydrate. I've used it extensively. It's one of the only successful sports supplement products, in my opinion, that and a whey protein isolate, maybe one or two others, by the way. And a lot of our athletes, non-weight class oriented athletes consume it because there is a, a cell volumizing effect of creatine that helps you add weight, water weight, but it pulls it into the muscle per se instead of subcutaneous. So to answer your question, my suggestion would be anywhere between three and five grams on average once per day and give it two to three weeks to really start to kick in. In that period of time, you will notice most of you, as long as you are a responder, about one third of the people are non-responders to creatine in general. You will notice a pretty discernible change to your physique. Usually shoulders look a little rounder and wider, kind of the skin gets a little shrink wrapped. You might gain one to three extra repetitions on a, a, a six rep set. So your six rep set will become an eight to 10 rep set in a few weeks period of time, which in turn, will enhance muscle protein synthesis and your, your body will start replicating new muscle tissue. That will be a direct benefit of, because creatine monohydrate is a fuel substrate effectively, right? It's not a steroid. It just 
it adds additional fuel that allows you to get an extra rep or two or three in time. And those extra reps provide the necessary overload or the, the, the stimulatory effect that tells your body to then create new muscle tissue to handle these heavier loads, right? And that's a very, you know, general you know, explanation of, of what's working behind the scenes. So don't think it's more than it is. It's just a little bit of extra energy to perform the workout. Um, so that being said, kind of long, longer winded answer, but, but hopefully helpful. Now there is good science as, as I will put as an aside that shows the cognitive benefit of creatine monohydrate supplementation in offsetting Alzheimer's and dementia. Now I'm not quite in the position. I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak too deeply on that, but I've listened to many smart people speak deeply on that. And that's an area I'm starting to educate myself more on as we work with athletes who transition out of combat sports and cognitive health is a real concern. I mean, for all of us, we have, many of us have seen dementia and, and Alzheimer's show up in our families at some point, some way. There is the lipid conversation of, of dementia, which is something to be aware of, but also what creatine might be able to do long-term is an interesting conversation that, that I think that's about as, as much as I can say intelligently until I get more information. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I just didn't know how to answer the specific, uh, you know, I know five grams a day is generally recommended, but, and that's the other thing is people, I think people run out and they like, you know, talk to somebody in a gym, they're like, oh, I'm using creatine. So somebody starts to use it. It's not just going to work magically by itself. Um, you're exactly right. It's, it's literally phosphocreatine. That's what powers like anaerobic type activity. So lifting, you still have to put the work in. You have to put extra work in extra um, work for in. you to see any benefits from it. Um, so my suggestion would be, don't just take your creatine and expect magic to happen. Um, you know, you still have to put extra progressive, progressively overloaded work in, in the gym, uh, to see that added benefit. Yeah, for me, it's like, like on, on the bench press and I'm not a big bench presser, right. But I can bench press and I can bench press 315, which is like the, the bro level of respect in a gym. You can put three plates on and get a couple good reps. Then like, you're good no matter where you go. And like, that's a dude thing. I don't know how it is in, in the gyms I go to anyway. So I could usually I could usually grind out maybe six reps with 315 throughout the year, give or take. Sometimes it's ugly. I'll get two good reps and then some ugly reps after that. And sometimes it's super clean. When I go on like a creatine run, I can usually then get to like seven, eight clean reps without really changing lifestyle or diet. And then as I cycle off creatine, I usually use lose like like two, three weeks later, I'll lose a rep or two. That's totally bro and totally anecdotal, but I'm a person who lives a pretty, like pretty much the same day over and over again. I train at the same basic times. I eat the same basic things. I go to bed at the same basic time. So like I'm, it, it's easier for me to evaluate what something does on myself. And I'll usually gain like one solid rep and then one grinder. And then I'll kind of lose that over a period of time depending on how, you know, compliant I am. And I, I've been able to maintain that for periods of time, but again, I'm not really a, a big bench presser. So FYI. That was a, uh, a humble brag, as you like to say. It was a little bit. It was a little bit. I mean, come on, I've been training, like I've been strength training for 30 years now. Yeah. Like if I can't bench press 315 after 30 years of training, you yeah, know, pretty seriously. And I've benched over 500 pounds before too. So like, yeah. I've been up, up there uh, that, and that was in a, in a single ply polyester shirt, to be clear. I never did a, a 500 plus raw just so everybody knows I'm not trying to like overly brag. And there's not, and my training partner used to rep 500 raw. I, I like, I, 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 I hate, I'm not hated him, but I was like, fucking son of a bitch. Like he just was built big barrel chest. He had short, like I had a longer arms than him. And I was, you know, I was, I was 40, 50 pounds. It was little tiny reps. It was. And he, man, but it was a, it was beautiful to watch. And he would almost unrack the day. Like I would just kind of cover the bar for him to unrack it. Cause he just wanted that like perfect setup and his back would lock in. But and he was a specialist, a guy like Joe McCall. If I've mentioned Joe be before, Joe is one of the, one of the greatest multi-time world record holder right here, you know, in New Jersey, not far from where I am right now, a good friend of mine. Um, and he was a guy, I was like, holy shit. I, he was the first guy I saw ever bench press 500 pounds. 
he might have been 181 or 198 at the time. So like from a, like a Wilk score perspective, I was like, holy shit. Like I, I don't even know that I was I wasn't even hitting 315 at that point. I was I was a kid and he wasn't, you know, he's maybe 10, 15 years older than me. Right. Somebody my students were just telling me somebody in the the NFL draft is supposed to break the bench record at the combine. Oh wow. I forget the name, but the, the reps, it's they do 225, I think. Yeah. For reps. I think the record is like somewhere in the 40s, which is yep. absurd. Um, but yeah, I think there's I can't remember the guy's name, but supposed to Supposed to or says he's going to break it. It's, and you know what's funny about the bench press, though? It, it is such a terrible indicator of strength. Oh, my God. <laughs> what, what is the applicability from that to football success? <laughs> any, any success in life. Right. What does the bench press have to do with anything? Because right. never are we sitting in, in a fixed horizontal plane needing to push for that much energy right and it, it's such an anatomically poor position anyway yeah what is the point of this thing mm -hmm. right you know but if, if you don't i mean here i am bragging about it and i don't even <laughs> like you know and in the big the grand scheme of thing i don't even have a great bench press per se <laughs> um but yeah I, but still i mean shit 40 some odd reps with 225 i mean you could talk about that that's genetic elite right there oh my god that's that's I mean, most people most people can't do 225 for one. No. Right. So I think it just shows like how el genetically elite the, these NFL players are. Any pro athlete. Yeah. People don't understand like how special you must be to become a pro athlete. Right. It's it's a whole nother world. It's funny, like yeah. high school state champions get to the collegiate level and wash out because they're on a team. Wait, let, let's say like they're on a squad. They're they're a high school state champion. There's there's fifty states. Well, you're on a team of twelve, and if you're the thirteenth best state champion, you suck on your team. By the way, yep. like you're the you're the you're the guy on the freaking bench to like just kind of like you know put that yeah. in perspective. Right. Plus, like take a state like Pennsylvania. There's six classifications. So yeah. like if you're talking football, there's technically six Pennsylvania state champions. Yeah. Which I always thought they should go a step further and have like a, a champions tournament. But, yeah. you know, still still an unbelievable feat, but I get what you're saying. And it's right, because here in New Jersey, a lot of the stuff I base is based off wrestling, right? That's my background. Yeah. New Jersey is one of the few states we have one absolute wrestling state champion in each weight class. Nice. Like, it's because we have, you know, districts and regions, then super regions, and then states. There's only one. That's the way it should be. I don't understand that. Regardless of district, regardless of fun, re like regardless, there should at the end be one champion in that category. And, you know, whatever the school system is, we have the NJSIAA here and, you know, every state has it. I never understood that. It never made sense to me because I, I, yeah. I travel and I'd be like, oh, I'm a state champ. Like I, you, you speak to three state champions from the same state. Right. Like, fucking who's better? And they're like, oh, I beat him three years ago in, in whatever, you know, tournament. It's like well, that does, it does like that that doesn't matter, right? You know, so it, 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 that's a little frustrating, I think, in in all sports worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be fair, like you know, uh, a one A school in Pennsylvania is like the smallest school. So if you take a team sport, I guess it makes sense because you know, say your basketball team, there's only eight kids in the entire school that play basketball, yeah. versus like these massive schools, there might be a hundred kids that try out for the team. So. Yeah, but I would say that there should be, and you and I, we're going to solve the world here. There should be a criteria in that, like that's where like super regions come in, mm -hmm. like because they won it, they won within their class. They're still not competing against the state. Right. So if it's called a a state championship, it should be the entire state is welcome to join, and then you can funnel your way up through the system, but also have that that asterisk title. Uh, that hey, you are the number one small school state champion. That's right. fine, but you're not the overall. Like a bodybuilding competition would have all the weight classes, like MPC Nationals. For those who follow that, you will have your division champion, and then they have the overall. So the the, the lightweight world champion, the best world best, or the lightweight champion, national champion, will move on to become a pro, and that is the number one lightweight in the world. But they lost the overall to the light heavyweight. Right. Who's the best absolute bodybuilder in the nation on that night? 
I, I like that more absolute terminology. Mm-hmm. And I, but yeah, I, I, I could get into the whole PC culture and the participation trophy mentality that's out there. Not that, not because this is long rooted well, but I mean, it's going back decades and decades. Oh, this no. system, when I was in school, it was the same way. And I wasn't part of the participation generation. I was spit on it and, and, you know, rub some dirt on the wound and get back on the field, you know, or, or you suck kind of mentality. So slightly different. Yeah, I know the, the participation medal trophy conversation. I could go on for days. Oh, maybe, maybe next episode of ask the dietitian. We will actually, cause I think that would be a fun one and everybody here make sure next week. So normally it, it, it's every Monday between like around 11 AM Eastern standard yeah. time is the ask the dietitian. Lindsay had a meeting today. Um, so we were happy to move. It actually worked out well. It gave me a more time this morning with the kids. We had the awesome. long DDC this weekend, which was great. And uh, that, you know, I, I get my, my girl time, as I call it, in you know, on the weekends quite a bit. So I didn't get quite all the girl time. Um, and I'm making for, making up for it today, which was awesome. Awesome. All right. So let, let's jump in. We've got more questions. Let's try and run through this as we continue on. Um, boom, boom, boom. We answered Joe. And Nick L. What's up, Nick? Um, what's up, Coach? Shout out to Lindsay for doing my diet consult on a Sunday. Lindsay is gangster, by the way. Uh, looking forward to getting shredded with her help. Excellent. Um, and anyone who's interested, if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Lindsay, you can click the link below this video. Also, you can work one-on-one -on -one with Lindsay to build you a complete personalized eight-week meal plan in which she actually becomes your personal registered dietitian. This is an amazing benefit that not a lot of other teams offer. They want to roll you into just a, a crappy template program. You can literally work one-on-one -on -one with Lindsay. You can do a consultation with her to troubleshoot some areas of, of your life and uh, just click the link below. And Nick L, Lindsay even made time on a Sunday, which is kudos to you, Professor Howard. No, it was a fun conversation. We're like 40 minutes in and I realized that he, he mentioned the, the DDC. I was like, oh, you're the guy. You're the guy in Chicago. Nick so is that the we're guy. talking about that. Yep. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for anyone interested, we are we are right now looking to host an in-person Dolce Diet Certification and Fitness Conference, level one and level two. So the nutrition conference and the strength training conference all at the same time. A myriad of guest stars, guest coaches, guest speakers. This will be a multi-day event in Chicago, 30 minutes from O'Hare. We will have the hotel taken care of, transport taken care of, an amazing venue like uh, a stadium seating classroom style. Lindsay, you'll be so comfortable in there. Of course, you'll be comfortable on the strength training floor, all hosted uh, by Mr. Nick L, who's just a, a, a member of the community. Many will, will notice Nick L from being here and being a part of the community, um, but also has been behind the scenes uh, working with us individually, one-on-one uh, -on -one in his own career. And I cannot wait. So folk like, Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen, like pay attention because we're just we're waiting for pandemic protocols to allow us to get in there. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be stuck in masks. I don't have to worry about a lot of the stuff that's going on. I don't want to, you know, have to tiptoe around regulations. So we've waited almost a year now. We'll wait just a little bit longer. But right now it's looking like maybe June as things are starting to open up as as you know, some of our contacts are telling us as restrictions are opening, we could actually host them here in New Jersey right now with a smaller class size. But I think this event will be the first one back and it's going to be we're going to do it big. So, Nick L, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. And I'm excited. I'm excited to get to Chicago in June, by the way. Fingers crossed. Right. Yeah. That'd be awesome. All right. All right. So Mike Cotto, boom, preparation is everything. Amen. Charlie Harper. I just, <laughs> as a two and a half men, former fan, I think I could say just the Charlie Harper name is, 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 you know, just awesome. And I'm sure you've heard it a million times. So I'm not going to be that guy. Um, question. It's been said that you can't get big doing high volume push-ups. But if that's true, how do those prison dudes get so huge? Thanks in advance. Well, I, I'm friends with some of those prison dudes, and I know for a fact that they get Diana Ball smuggled into jail. I'm just saying, I know for a fact they get all, they get more juice in jail than you can get in, in your local Globo gym. But they're already in jail, and it's easy to smuggle that stuff in, and there's a high priority. And it's crazy 
But at the same time, hey, that happens. Now, not all these dudes. And we might actually want to jump over to Wes Watson's channel. If you don't know Wes Watson, he is a former convicted felon in the federal uh, prison system. He's got this super, like, intense, crazy attitude, tells these prison stories, and he's super yoked. So maybe uh, maybe I can get we can get Wes on the show. That'd be, actually be fun. Um, but I'm, I'll let me I'll, I'll finish and then I'll kick it to you, Lindsay. I would say it's there's a genetic predisposition for people to make gains based upon minimal exercise. That the dudes getting huge off of push-ups, well, they're gonna be big fucking dudes anyway. They're just genetically receptive to training stimuli. But I will say if they were in a well-equipped gym with proper sleep, stress management, and food, they would be massively more developed than what we see inside jail. Now, look at a gymnast. Look at a wrestler. These athletes are yoked and packed also, and they are body weight conditioned athletes primarily. You don't see gymnasts and wrestlers training with a lot of progressive overload, with a lot of re resistance. So you can see a lot of these genetic cofactors take place. That's just kind of my um, you know, anecdotal response to that, that it, it's very much genetic. Because there's a lot of dudes in prison that aren't yoked. And I would say you just see the ones that stand out, the genetic superiors, where these guys, they, they might have been able to go to the NFL if, if life took a turn, different turn. Th those people walk around. You'll see that guy at Starbucks or at Home Depot. You're like, holy shit. Right? massive dude who just happened to tear his hamstring junior year of high school and fucking never did his PT and started smoking weed. And he could have been, you know, the, the, the next Jerome Bettis or whoever else that might be. So that, that's just my little kick. Yeah. The other question is they were probably already huge before they went to prison. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Like they had already been there, been big, went to jail and then kind of snapped back up again. Right. Had a little right. bit of muscle memory kick in. Yeah. I'm um, awesome. All right. Henrik, what's up, Henrik? Mike and Lindsay, hope you guys had a great DDC. Of course we did. I was wondering how you guys would handle talking to parents about their kids' sugar intake and unhealthy habits with, without stepping on too many toes. Well, the last part might be a problem. Lindsay, do you have any insight on this? Yeah. I mean, I think health is the, the best way to, to start the conversation is obviously parents want their kids to be healthy. But the biggest pushback you'll get is like, parents will say, well, let kids be kids, which I understand. I mean, I don't have kids, but I agree with that. Let kids be kids. But to what extent? So I guess pretty much just honing in on the, the health aspect and almost like not, not from a threatening approach or a, like a scare them straight approach, but make them aware of the re very real things that could happen. Um, how common diabetes is, how common childhood ob obesity is, how expensive it is to take care of cavities, things like that. Um, so I think going from a from a health standpoint is the best kind of way to approach that type of situation. Yeah, and I'll jump in and be very clear. I will step on toes. I will be clear. And I will say shame on you. And I've done this. Shame on you, parents and any parents right now watching and listening. Please pay attention. Shame on you for poisoning your children because it's easy or because your idiot friends do that or your peer groups do that or because Hershey and Nestle and, and, and you know, Kraft tell you that it's okay because marketing schemes are created to tell you it's okay to poison your children with synthetic toxic chemicals when childhood obesity is at the highest rate it has been in recorded history. Childhood diabetes is at the highest rate it has been in recorded history. And how dare you poison your children because it's easy to do that. It's easier to give your kid a piece of candy than to educate them on the dangerous effects of processed sugar and synthetic toxic chemicals. Most people know they should not eat candy and drink soda and eat cake and all the crap because they're, quote, trying to get healthy while at the same time they're feeding that garbage to their children. How does that make any sense? It makes zero sense. 
So do not poison little Jane after she hits the winning home run at Little League. Do not poison little Johnny when he brings home his A-plus on his report card. Do not associate self-abuse with success. That's Because as we get older, what happens? Oh, I'm going to go celebrate and poison myself. This is what happens. Holidays have become commercialized poisoning sessions for families. Easter's coming. Most people will get a big Easter basket and they will fill it with heroin for their children. Right? They will have the marshmallow peeps. They will have jelly beans. They will have Sour Patch Kids. They will have Cadbury eggs and big chocolate bunnies and a whole bunch of other shit. How many grams of synthetic toxic chemicals is that? How many grams of sugar is that? How many calories is that? How much hydrogenated oils is that? How many preservatives are there in that, that big box, that big basket? How can you give that to your children? And people say, but Dolce, don't be such a square man. One piece of candy won't kill them. Fuck you, I say. How dare you say that, you lazy motherfucker, because it's not one piece of candy. You poison your children every day, multiple times per day. From the time they wake up, you stuff processed sugars into their fucking face because you're lazy. And you don't love your children enough to do the hard things, to make a lifestyle change, to not buy this garbage. That's the problem because you yourself are unhealthy. And you will not make the change because you don't love your children enough to teach them how to love themselves. I get, I'm a, the father. I have two children. I am a father of children, right? So I, I can speak directly to this. And it makes me sick to see other families do this to your children. So the Easter basket in my house is bigger than my kids. They could literally crawl into their Easter baskets and fall asleep. What's in there? The biggest most beautiful stuffed animal you've ever seen instead of the chocolate bunny. There are arts and crafts. There are puzzles. There are coloring books. There are all sorts of STEM projects in there. There's little stickers. There's all sorts of activities that will feed their brain and open their mental horizons that are in there. There are the, the stuffed animals from every Easter since my kids are born are in their beds right now not some piece of shit chocolate fucking bunny that might push them over the line and turn them into a diabetic. My kids don't have that association of poisoning themselves in order to feel good about themselves or to feel like their parents love them or to celebrate some bullshit commercialized holiday. So as I said, stepping on many toes is, is not... <laughs> not a part of this conversation, but I will speak like that because I can speak with authority because I have children in my house right now and I am a dad and I'm also a fitness professional and I'm also way fucking more fit than nearly any person who will try and say anything negative about what I just said. And I will say, prove me wrong. Show me the data because I'm looking at the CDC website right fucking now. Are you a science denier? I'm not. I'm speaking to the science. This is what the science says because Cadbury tells you otherwise or your brother-in-law or your grandma says something different doesn't mean it's accurate. They're the science denier. Give your kid a cigarette. One puff of the cigarette won't kill them, right? One shot of, of proper 12 whiskey won't kill a four-year-old, right? Probably not, but you'll go to fucking jail if you give that to them. Why is it normalized behavior to allow them to have an equally, equally dangerous chemical compound as addictive as cocaine, which is processed sugar? All science supports that. Why can we so freely feed that to our children? So anyway, that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> in so many words. In, in so many words. I mean, yeah, yeah. Take it, take it for what it is. Yeah. Um, but I think, I mean, another good piece of advice, especially for parents of super young children, is to never associate. We even learn about this, like going through like an undergraduate dietetics program is to never associate food with reward. Yeah. Like, oh, you're potty training. Here's a pack of 
gummy bears or whatever it is. Um, never associating doing something good with food. Because like Mike just said, throughout your whole life, you'll think like, oh, I just got a promotion. I'm going to go out and eat whatever I want. Um, or I, I'm a college student. I just want a game. I'm going to go out and eat and drink whatever I want. So to not associate food, especially bad food, because that's usually what happens, never associate food with rewards. So never rewarding yourself with, you know, especially bad foods. So. Yep. I agree. And that's what it is. Food, food shouldn't be a reward unless it's high net nutrient, helpful food, maybe where it's like you make a meal in your own house with your family. Like that's, Again, I'll, I'll inject, you know, first person into the conversation. That's what we do in our home. We bring our children into the kitchen. We make memories by making these meals together, by teaching them the sustainability of preparing healthful whole foods for themselves and for the family. The love and intention that goes into preparing meals for the people you care about. We teach them how to select the right nutrients that will be life affirming, life giving nutrients instead of just driving through a drive through and poisoning them because you're too lazy to teach them the right things to do. And that's unfortunate. And I know some people get pissed off when I speak like that, but nobody says I'm wrong. Right. You get mad and get mad because that is the emotional anchor that will then make you really rethink your decisions like son of a bitch. Yeah, that fuck. Uh, yep. I, and then you'll start to feel bad because you'll start to remember the time that you actually did poison your kid when they did something well. Or just because you wanted to scroll your stupid phone so you let them go and have some candy or chips or soda or something like that. Don't 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 make me walk you through the village shaming you. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, all right. There's a bunch more questions. I don't know if we can quite get to every single one, but I'm let's try and run through here. Um Zach C, thank you. Thank you for the $5 Super Chat donation. Zach C of the Leopard Underwear fame in Las Vegas, by the way. We have some photos of Zach C at the Vegas pools. Leopard print um, mantis, we'll call them. For Max, stubborn fat loss. Is it more effective to do lists immediately following steady state cardio weight training once glycogen is depleted and then dumping in Yohimbine. Uh, Lindsay, you want to jump in, offer any thoughts on, on best times to, you know, perform lists? Yeah. So, I mean, exercise itself does suppress insulin, but the best time to do it is when your insulin is fully suppressed, which is after you've slept for eight or nine hours, um, plus adding exercise on top of that. Yep. So yeah, you could do it after an exercise session, but if you have the time during your day to, to get your list in in the morning and then do your uh, weight training later in the afternoon or in the evening, that's definitely the most effective means of uh, maximizing your stubborn fat loss. Agreed. Agreed. Um, what else we got? Timestamps. Um, Jesse says, when programming a nutrition plan for the general population, do you have a checklist as far as calories or macros, micronutrients go to get them to be compliant? Well, I, I think going through what I like to do, and I'll let Lindsay answer here, is I like to go through a baseline and understand what they have been eating, which gives us, without blood work, it's hard to know definitively where they may or may, may not be deficient or imbalanced. But we can get a pretty good idea if we go through a log and we understand what do you normally eat? Like, holy shit, you eat zero vegetables. Like, all right, that we could have some some you know deficiencies there. So kind of going through that. Also, geographic location matters. What part of the world do they live in? What type are they a marathon runner, like a female marathon runner, as opposed to like a steak eating bodybuilder bro dude? there's going to be some differences there that inherent differences that we're aware of. So without blood work, it's a little more challenging, but what we do know is providing our basic ingredient list of 60 or so basic ingredients will do a very good job of ensuring access to the majority of the vital micro and phytos. And then there could be some individual variability with my own ability to synthesize those to, you know, accept and, and, and absorb those. Yeah. Um, just the, the comp compliance part. 
when somebody starts starts off first, the number one thing that I get as far as feedback is, you know, first week is energy levels. Everybody has drastically enhanced energy. Um, you know, they're they're feeling, you know, they don't they don't feel sluggish in the afternoon. Just increase energy. I'm like that alone should tell you that you're doing something right. Whether or not, you know, you might be four weeks in, you're not really seeing the tail, the uh, scale tip at all, but you're feeling awesome and that, that will come. So I think that's, that's the best way, um, at least in my opinion, to continue to get your clients to be compliant is that you're feeling better. You know, you're doing something good for your body um, and the rest of those goals will come. But yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And Joe asked this for the second time, so I, I want to answer for you, Joe. It's, it's a good question. What's your advice to target lower back fat? Is the hardest part to burn fat and also fat under the chest? So these are those gender-specific body fat areas that we touched on in the beginning of this video. Mm -hmm. First and foremost is you have to be living the right lifestyle. You have to be reducing total body fat. So you have to be in a, a, a fat burning zone or living a, a lifestyle that is conducive to burning non-functional body fat because there is functional body fat also. We can't be 0% body fat. For most healthy, athletic, adult males, we want you to be below 14% body fat on average, right around 11 to 12%. It might be the sweet spot. You look great. You have abs. We can see the vein running down your bicep. You don't have to be carrying your chicken and rice around with you. You can live a normal life, right? That usually most of the year, I live right around 11% body fat. Every so often, I'll, I'll dip that down to like maybe nine or so once. And I haven't done that actually since last summer. And this summer, I'll kind of dip down to 8% again and hold that for a little while for whatever. And it's easy to get there once you kind of maintain but I won't really have that, that Christmas tree come in, me personally, until I get down to like 10%. I have to suffer a little bit personally. Now, I got a buddy who's like 14, 15% body fat. His, his waist is perfect. He holds fat in his ass and his thighs, like just the way he's kind of built, which is I was, I was telling him he's got his, his mom's genetics, um, and you know, because his upper body looks great. He hold, he's kind of like a little heavy lower half, kind of like from mid glute all the way down. Not that I, I see his glutes all the time, but you know what I mean. We have this conversation, so exposed, exposed, busted, um, and I'm okay to say that. So, but what the point is, you actually to get that final bit of of stub gender specific stubborn body fat off, you got to suffer a little bit. You really have to dip down and diet and work and sleep and manage stress because your body is going to fight you. It will fight you to hold on to that. And you really, we don't hack. I never hack the body. I hate the term. I'm going to hack my body. We don't. We cultivate an environment in which my body will be most efficient to facilitate the progress I'm looking for. So I'm not hacking the body. We can only work with the body. Lindsay, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I completely agree. I mean, you hit on everything that I, that I would say. It's, you know, once you've done everything that you could possibly do, it's just like pushing through that extra ceiling. Um, you know, most people, term, most people use the term plateau. Well, are you really plateauing or, or are you just not pushing hard enough? That's it. So. And, and it's, we say that you lose fat in steps, not slides. So like, I'll, you know, I'll kind of like be baseline. I'll diet my ass off. I'll work off and boom, I'll lose fat. And I kind of, I plateau again, but your plateau is relative to your lifestyle. And just, just like Lindsay just said, it's like, man, like if I want to get down to like 8% body fat, like I know I got about 10 weeks of suck ahead of me right now. I, I, like, I know that in like kind of like end of winter and like, you know, kind of entering to spring. Well, this was a pretty good lifestyle. You know, I could kind of eat. I, I was like bordering on like a 300 calorie like surplus, nothing crazy, but still tighter. I was upping my energy, my activity levels. I was like focused on areas of stress management and lifestyle. You know, I was focused on progressive overload, increasing volume and intensity in the gym. Well, that's actually that's kind of enjoyable, a little more structure than maybe the average person would enjoy. But now I'm like, all right, I've been doing that and I'm kind of plateaued right now. And here we come. April 1st is coming right on target. And it's like, all right, 
I got to tighten some things up right now. So to answer your question, Joe, and it's a great question, and that's for me to lose like my lower back fat. I got to go through about six weeks of suck. It's just like six weeks, eight weeks of suck, man. But that's the way it is. And then once you get it, it becomes really easy to maintain it though. Like it, 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 like you don't have to like just live a sucky life. Your body will actually start to normalize and then maintain that. And then me personally, I'll slowly start to refeed back into it and try and build some extra muscle, stuff the shirt, as we said. Um, what else? Da, da, da. Appreciate that. Uh, bench press stuff kind of covered that. Um, Protein. Wonder Boy says, good day to both of you. I'm not sure I'm taking in enough protein for my body, for my goals. What's the best way to increase protein inexpensively? Lindsay, you care to, to jump in? Yeah, I mean, just thinking of like me personally, my two main pr pr uh, protein sources are probably eggs and chicken, yep. which are very inexpensive. Eggs are like the cheapest, most nutritious things that you could buy. Yeah. Um, I feel bad for people who can't eat eggs or like react negatively to eggs. So I'm like, I eat eggs every single morning. Um, super cheap, lots of protein. Um, but if you're not sure, I mean, see how you do with just a slight bump in grams per day. Um, keep track of what you typically eat and then just intentionally add a little bit and see if you see any, any progress or results. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I mean, chicken and eggs, like that is the go-to staple. Also, uh-oh, what a perfect time. What a perfect time. Here's another great way to bump your protein, by the way. This episode is brought to you by Certified Piedmontese. Go to Piedmontese.com and feed your family the same way I feed mine. Right now, use promo code DOLCE to save 25% on grass-fed, grass-finished beef with free delivery. That's Piedmontese.com. Boom! Piedmontese.com, ladies and gentlemen, definitely go and check that out. That Everything we say there is 100% true. This is the only beef I trust to feed my family. Certified grass-fed, grass-finished beef raised right here in Nebraska in the United States. This is a, quote, small family farm relative to a national company, but it is very much run like a mom and pop shop. Um, and I will say that if you use that Dolce promo code, I get no money for that. We get no money for that. That savings is completely passed on to you. So use it or don't use it. It has no financial impact to us. It's a great discount. Also, orders over $99, you will get free shipping to your door within two days. So Piedmontese.com, promo code Dolce, save 25%, spend $99.99, get free delivery in two days to your door. Fill your freezer, feed your family the exact same way I do mine. I cannot say enough about certified Piedmontese, by the way. Um, Sam Corey, what's up, coach? Lindsay and Mike, thank you so much for the amazing weekend on the DDC. So pumped, Sam. Awesome having you, brother. Really appreciate you being there. Sam is over there in the UK and uh, crushing. We have coaches. We have Mr. Henrik, who's over there in Sweden. We have Doug Kay, who is in Scotland right now. Uh, we have coaches from around the world. Jamie Whitman's up there um, in your neck of the woods in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I forget exactly as I sit here right now exactly. I think Jamie might be she in the Pittsburgh area, I believe. So but still, Pennsylvania. What's up, Esri? Good to see you. Um, tips for hair loss. I would suggest you check out More Plates, More Dates channel. Derek has a great channel. He's hundreds of thousands of su subscribers right now. We have a few buddies in common. He really does focus on this. More Plates, More Dates. That's the channel. He talks a lot of, of pharmacologic interventions with regards to hair loss, but also steroids and building your physique. Not that I suggest that per se, but the hair loss stuff is really cutting edge. Um, and he actually reversed a lot of his own um, balding and kind of has a pretty full head of hair right now. Information purposes only, by the way, it's certainly not an endorsement to go out and follow the protocols, but Derek and more plates, more dates, and definitely leave in the comments that you, you learned about them from us. Um, what else? Um, what's up, Dolce questions? Any thoughts on this, Lindsay? 
Um, I don't think it depends on your product. So if you're drinking like a, you know, just a seltzer water that has no, you know, artificial sugar, anything like that, you know, just naturally sweetened, like hint of lime, hint of orange, whatever. I think it's totally fine. I don't think it's beneficial by any means. So I wouldn't recommend adding this to your diet. But if you're somebody who is like trying to kick a soda habit or something like that, definitely switch uh, to, to a little bit of carbonated water just to help you, you know, if some people crave that carbonation. I think it's totally fine. Not in excess. We still want the bulk of our hydration to come from just your typical water. Um, but no, I'll have a, I'll have a carbonated water every now and then just as like a little treat, I guess. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with you. So what we look towards is the cleaner, like I will do mostly is I think it's a Pellegrino carbonated mm -hmm. water. That's my, my favorite for sure. Comes in a glass bottle. Um, cause I'm that guy. And also it's just, it's, it's carbonated mineral water, which is delicious. Um, and I'll usually it's like a summer drink for me more than anything. And I'll squeeze some fresh lime into it. You go to a restaurant, they're going to charge you like six or $8 a glass. Like I'll go to Costco and I'll get a case of it and just keep it in, in our refrigerator. And it, it's like pennies on the dollar to like be all fancy and foo-foo. So like, you don't have to, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a frugal guy. You don't have to overspend for that. Now there are some some cheap carbonated drinks out there, many of which are flavored with synthetic toxic chemicals, though they will claim natural or they will claim healthy, sugar-free, like look at the ingredients. And even if it says natural, if it says natural flavors, just know that means they're unnatural, All right? That it's just, it, it, it makes no sense, but that's how fucked the government is. They actually allow unnatural ingredients to fall under the banner of natural with regards to food labeling. So if it says natural flavoring and doesn't say exactly what the flavors are, like our forthcoming whey protein isolate, the Dolce Whey Pro, it is completely naturally flavored. But we break down our, we have a um, non-GMO sunflower lecithin. And there is a, 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 a GMO version of that, a synthetic version of that. Our vanilla is actually sweetened with organic vanilla. That's it, right? Our, our chocolate is sweet or is, is flavored with organic cacao. That's it. So we will actually list the ingredients, not hide behind proprietary labeling that just says natural flavor additives and whatnot. So just be aware of that, and, and that's the way, way we go. Now, Adam Hart also, Coach Adam Hart, Dolce Diet Certified Coach um, down there in Spain. Good to see you, brother. Can't wait to get down, by the way, Adam. I, I definitely want to check out what you got going on. Amazing coach. Everyone should definitely check out Adam Hart, uh, what he's doing down there. If you want a high-quality, competent uh, coach, check out Adam Hart. Um, and Adam says, I'd like to hear some thoughts on 78% of all COVID cases are obese. Would you say we've been locked down because of the fatties? I, yeah. Yes. I, yes, of course. The, the, like, Lindsay, you want to, you know, you want to add anything, yeah. your thoughts on that, what you may or may not know? Yeah. I mean, I'm taking Adam's word for it, that that's the, tr the true number. I don't know. Um, but I would guess that it's that high, 70, 78% of all cases. Um, but it's not just, it's not just obesity. Do you know any obese person that doesn't have another comorbidity? Most of them, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, um, smokers. There's a whole list of things. Um, and if, if we lived in a world where everybody was perfectly healthy, then I don't think it would be an extreme health risk to contract COVID. And that's just my opinion. Because there's another stat that exists is percentage of not just cases, but percentages of death are very old people. Um, people with a lot of comorbidities. So it's very, very rare that an extremely healthy person um, contracts COVID and has horrible symptoms. Now, I do know some people that are younger, like closer to my age, that have had pretty severe cases. So I don't know if we could blame it all on your term, quote, fatties. But I think the bigger issue here is that the, the push right now is just stay home, wear your mask, wear two masks, um, you know, get a vaccine. That's the only push. And there's zero push of 
why don't you change your lifestyle so you have a lesser chance of contracting, you know, these types of, uh, of viruses and other, other illnesses that exist. Um, so I think that's the part that gets me the most is that there's no push from the government to become a healthier population. And it's almost like they're rewarding unhealthy people. If you're somebody that wanted a vaccine, they're rewarding people who are unhealthy by allowing them to get the vaccine first. So it's, it's a little backwards in my mind, but yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And, and let me pull this up um, to Adam's point right now, if, if you guys can see this. So this is from the CDC. So cdc.gov. And I didn't have enough time to like pull out, pull out every single study. But right here, obesity worsens outcomes from COVID-19. And this right here says having obesity may triple the risk of hospitalization due to a COVID-19 infection. Having obesity increases the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. People who are overweight may also be at an increased risk. So obesity is linked to impaired immune function. Um, obesity decreases lung capacity and reserve and can make ventilation more difficult. As BMI increases, the risk of death from COVID-19 increases. Studies have demonstrated that obesity may be linked to lower vaccine responses for numerous diseases. So as we go, I mean, that's from the CDC site itself. So, you know, let's not deny science. Let's accept the science as it is without really going deeper into all of the maps and criteria. That being said, yeah. And this is I actually got shadow banned on Facebook and Instagram. And I believe also here on this network, because this is exactly what I said. Last year, kind of like end of spring, beginning of summer, everyone was wearing the masks and doing the whole thing. And I said, listen, if you wear your mask and tell everyone to social distance and shut down your business, but you're drinking soda and you have a BMI over 25 and you don't go to your doctor to get a comprehensive wellness test and blood work done to see if you have any comorbidities, shame on you because you're the science denier. If you're not walking outside for a minimum of 30 minutes every day in the sunlight, if you're not moving your body in an athletic manner, as science tells us we must do, you are the science denier. And whoo, boy, I got, I, and actually I got contacted by, by IG and, and FB, I don't want to quite say their names, saying that these posts, have, they actually removed my posts for saying that. And I said, wear your mask. Social distance. I'm a germaphobe, right? The cool. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. Gross. There's gross people everywhere. That That's fine. But do all these other things. They actually banned me for saying, wear your mask, social distance, follow all applicable laws, but also embrace the rest of the science. Don't just stop reading sentence number one, read through sentence number seven where it talks about the comorbidities. It talks about obesity. It talks about um, uh, repressed immune function. People stop there. And we look around right now. Look at all the Karens walking around right now. I haven't seen one fit Karen or Ken, by the way. Is that what we're calling them, the Kens out there? <laughs> None of those people look, look fit at all. So, Adam, I agree with you 100%. Um, Self-care and, and personal accountability, that's what matters most. Like, God damn, we should be washing our hands all the time every day. I'm not, I'm not mad at people wearing masks if they're handling my food to be honest with you i actually kind of like that i'd like to see them wearing gloves also because i see a lot of i see a lot of this by the way people wearing masks there should be a mandate that if you have a mask on you cannot touch the mask with your fingers if i have to to move fix my mask i actually will fix my mask at the ears not kind of not on the moist part of the mouth where most people they, they fix their mask like this because it slides. I'll actually take my fingers, grab the strap and I'll, I'll readjust it that way for whatever that little bit is worth. And I'm not touching anybody's food, by the way. I'm just trying to be like, you know, hy hygienically uh, um, uh, appropriate. Right. And not to not to shame people, but you brought up uh, following the science a lot. And it's it's very funny and ironic that the people that you see, like on Facebook and things like that, like you know, when there's like, you know, there's the anti-mask people and there's the extreme mask wearers that wear it by themselves in their cars. They're like, people, all you have to do is follow the science. Like, this is the science. This is the science. And again, not to shame people, but then they're posting their vaccination card and says, it'll say, because science. 
Yeah. And I'm like, what about the science that says, here's what you're supposed to eat and here's what you're supposed to drink and here's how you're supposed to exercise. Yeah. And you clearly don't. Clearly don't. And yeah. So you're following some science, but not all science. And most of those who are not age accepted. So age, we, we don't control age. We all age. So those who qualify for the COVID vaccine due to their age, that's not who I'm talking about. Those who qualify for the COVID vaccine due to their job, not who I'm talking about. Those who qualify for the COVID vaccine due to their terrible lifestyle choices, they should be at the back of the line. I do not qualify. I will be the last person to qualify for the COVID vaccine. And I and Lindsay and, and probably hopefully everyone here, we're the ones who are actually following the science. We're going to the doctor. I just got my blood work done on Thursday. We're going to the doctor. We're e exercising every day. We're eating well. I'm maintaining my body mass. I'm, I'm doing all the things. I don't qualify. I'll, I'll be like the last dude who's even allowed to get it if I do decide to eventually get it, which, again, I think you guys probably can tell whether or not I, I care to get it or think I need to get it at this point. My doctor doesn't seem to think I need it either, by the way, because we had that conversation. Um, but that's, that's a whole nother conversation. So I don't qualify. Isn't that crazy? People are like, oh, man, you're going to get it? I said, I don't qualify. They're like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Look at, look at, like, look at you guys. How do you, you qualify? You're, you're younger than me. How do you qualify with your cigarette? Now, you mentioned something. I was, I was doing my list this morning, walking the boardwalk. There's this fucking social justice warrior white knight sitting maybe like 20 feet off the boardwalk. And the, the beach kind of goes down. we got a pretty good beach. So maybe it goes down, you know, from the boardwalk to the ocean on the average day is maybe like 60, 80 yards, right? So that's a pretty good slice of beach right there. He's sitting like 20 feet off the boardwalk because that's the high traffic area. It's still a little chilly. Not a lot of people on the sand yet. He's sitting on the sand, kind of turned so like you can see his face all by himself with a mask on. All by himself sitting in the sand, like 20 feet onto the sand, probably 30 feet from where any human is actually walking on the boardwalk, sitting there with his mask on looking so proud of himself, right? All by himself, all by himself on a, a pretty windy day too, by the way. What I wanted, I like, and that got me thinking, I want to go around with my GoPro and interview these people and say, hey, you're wearing a mask right now. God, you, you're, you're, you're such a, a man of science. Can you explain to me why? Why, like, why? I want to hear, why are you wearing a mask 30 feet away from any other human on the beach when all science says you don't have to do that? Why are you doing that? What are the regulations? Do you guys have to, if it's like close quarters in New Jersey, do you have to wear masks? Well, what, right now, what they say is outside, if you're within six, within six feet of someone, you have to have a mask on. Outside of six feet, you don't, but it's like within 15 feet of someone for more than 15 minutes, then you have to put your mask back on. So it's like if we're just sitting out, like I'm walking the beach, the only people I really see wearing masks walking the boardwalk are those of an older population. And that's fine. Like I get it. Like 65 year olds and above, like, yeah, do what, like do what you have to do to make yourself feel safe. Even the dude sitting on the, the beach, if that makes him feel safe, great. But the mask he was wearing was just a traditional cloth mask. We know that those cloth masks are very ineffective at, avoiding transmission at, at resisting infection. So it's either you're wearing it because you're trying to protect me, not sure if you're asymptomatic, but you're 30 feet away from me with a class mask, cloth mask that the CDC and Dr. Fauci and everyone else says those cloth masks are not very effective. The surgical masks are slightly more effective, but they're not very effective at avoiding transmission. Right. So if you want it, and it, I had had like a little family conversation where I was the bad guy here, where every, you know, some people in a part of my family, they're all talking about how they're going to be, they're wearing two masks, wearing two masks. And they got all these fancy, expensive masks that are like matching their outfits and whatnot. So why are you wearing two masks? And they're like, Fauci said so. And like, well, that's what you're supposed to do to be, to be a good citizen. I said, so you're wearing the mask to avoid getting it they're like no to, to protect other people 
I said, all right, I respect that. I said, but if you're worried about spreading it to other people, maybe you shouldn't be planning travel. And in fact, you're standing in front of me right now at a family party with 40 people here without a mask on. And you're eating food that's on this table right now. So how do you, how do you make sense of that? And they're like, uh, well, well, you know, well, and it was kind of like, well, 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 I was like, listen, like, I'm not being a dick here. I'm just want to push you onto the science. So I'm very well aware of the science, by, by the way. So I get it. You're going to wear two masks. Why don't you just get an N95 mask if you're going to travel? If, if you're going to, if, if you care so much, why are you wearing that pretty Lululemon mask? Right. That, that matches your outfit. Why are you wearing that? And how come you're not wearing an N95 mask that we know definitively is the standard? Like, that's cool. I, I wear N95s like I, I got I spent the freaking money. They're expensive. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm in those situations, I got N95s. I travel. I wear the N95. Right. So, like, I, it, it's funny to have these conversations. I don't know if people are getting pissed off listening or you guys all agree. Probably. <laughs> But it's like, come on, we embrace the science. We read the science. We pour through the science. We're simply following the science. If you're worried about getting infected or infecting someone else, you must wear an N95. If not, you're lying to yourself. You're fooling. You're pretending. You're grandstanding. You're just, you're just virtue signaling. That's all it is. And I, I just want like people to wake up, follow the science or don't. Like don't pretend that you are. So I, I think I've been talking for a while here. Huh. I agree. Yeah. I can't, okay. I can't stand the, the people in their car by themselves. I can't stand it. What's up with that? Like, I want to pull up to next next to somebody at a red light and be like, same thing with the GoPro. Why? Why, Why? are you doing that? Like, like aren't, I'm like, I'm very curious. Like, yeah, I, I cannot understand this. I might be missing something. Please explain this to me. I want to know. If, and if they're like, hey, listen, like I have a rare lung disorder, right. I said, I do it. I get it. Let me back away from yeah. your Like In that case, I get it. Like a 1% a, a chance in that situation. I get it. But I would say, why are you outside then? I honestly, like if you're that worried, like my, my friends who are like double masking, but planning vacations, if you're so worried, you're actually going to go in airports and get on planes and go stay in hotels and go to amusement parks. Yeah. But you're wearing only, only the grocery store is scary. What's that? That only the grocery store is scary. Okay. Yeah. I, I was like, I, that doesn't make sense. Like if you're worried, then dude, stay home. That that would be, if, if you truly are following the science, mm -hmm. then you should probably be, uh, what is it? Um, sheltering at home, right? That, that's what we used to call it. Like in summertime, we're, we're all sheltering at home. Yes. While we're closing down businesses. Yeah. Well, there's um, also science, like back to your, your little buddy on the beach. There's also science that supports the healthy effects of breathing in like ocean air and all the minerals and things like that. Yep. I remember reading about it uh, last summer. because I was like, oh my gosh, everybody's immune systems are going to go to shit because they're not breathing in any of the, the healthy bacteria that you would normally breathe in in different environments. Absolutely. So, I don't this know. That is what wrong. Of, this is the last podcast we did, which now we're, we're hijacking again. <laughs> That's one of the reasons we proactively pulled our kids from school this year. Mm -hmm. We love their school. We love their teachers. We love the community. I and my wife do not want our children sitting with masks on for six hours a day in a plast plexiglass square. Mm-hmm. I, that will, that is not acceptable. And in the winter time, of course, where the windows are closed, right. And they, they have their little mask breaks. They had a couple mask breaks. They would go outside a few times throughout the day, but still my children will not sit and breathe through the mask. And we had to change our lifestyles and make accommodations to pull them from school to, to teach them, to homeschool them, to do the whole thing for them. Be, and that's a personal decision, of course. But to your point, Lindsay, we are aware of the data and the importance of children, all humans, but specifically children, to be able to breathe freely. Yep. And some people are like, oh, I have asthma. I wear the mask. Fuck out of here. Like with that social grandstanding bullshit, right? 
if, if uh, we can go deeper and deeper. So I, we'll keep on. We're going to do a whole show on this, I think. Yes. Um, and Adam also says, agree, if you keep squirting your hands and hiding from germs, you're going to get sicker quicker when you stop doing that. That's a great point also in that children in schools right now are not catching the common cold. Mm -mm. They're not getting sick. They're not being exposed to germs they are normally exposed to that we were all exposed to that have built our immunity to be resilient as we go through life. What will be the impact three, five, 10 years from now of children who are not exposed to these germs? And what happens if they do get chicken pox or the common cold? What will be, this is a true, that truly this is, mm -hmm. I'll get Dr. David Hawks back on to discuss this, by the way, virologist, Dr. David Hawks, to see what his thoughts are. Be great to get you on for that one too, Lens. Um, and just have this conversation, like what's going to happen now? Right. Like I wonder, because this is how our, our immunity is actually built based upon con con contamination and infection, mm -hmm. right? Kids exposure. are exposure. They're not going outside to play, most kids. They're stuck home inside their bubbles and inside their schools. They're not allowed to touch anything. And to Adam's point, they're constantly squeezing, you know, antibacterial on their hand, that killing good bacteria even. Yeah. So it, there's this, this, this conversation runs super deep. It's not just about wearing a mask. Like, this is a deep conversation. And the people telling us what to do are who? Andrew Cuomo? Right. And um, America's governor, Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, we're trusting that dude now. That dude, that's the dude for, for 11 months was the savior. Now, all of a sudden, we realize he's an idiot. That's the guy, the, our Surgeon General and Dr. Fauci, who both were screaming, do not wear masks, do not wear masks. Masks have no impact. Now they're saying we must wear masks after we get vaccinated. What, what, when do we believe them? Do we believe them the first time they lie or the second time they lie or the third time? they? Which lie do we believe? We, do we believe every lie? Like, when do you believe Fauci, by the way, before I get off the horse? Do I believe him when he says don't wear masks? Or do I believe him when he says we do wear masks? Do I believe him when he says get vaccinated? Or do I believe him when he says you got to wear your mask even if you get vaccinated? What the... Does any of this fucking, what is he going to say next month? And he's just the most prevalent. It's not so much an attack on him. I don't know him, but it's just nothing they say matches the data set that we all have access to. But most people, they get their medical opinion from news, talking heads, journalists on the news stations who simply want you to click and watch. Yeah. Sheep. 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 Um, all right. Uh, Simon P. had a question here and he actually donated. So let's answer Simon's question. Um, Simon P. says, how I'm 17. How can I increase my height? Ooh, and Lindsay is in the basketball world. So height does matter. So you do have any because I'm sure you and some people, you know, have tried certain techniques to get taller, possibly. I know I tried when I was a kid, by the way, and I wanted to play basketball and I realized I need to wrestle instead. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Simon, do you have a traction table? Ooh. I'm just kidding. No, okay. well. <laughs> stretch it out. No, um, just, I mean, height is definitely genetics for sure. Um, you know, there are tall families, there are short families. There's the, you know, the odd man out, you never know. But if, if you're 17, I mean, you're still growing and you need nutrients in order to grow. So I would definitely recommend just getting as many nutrients in as possible you're in a growing phase. So that means you need extra calories. I'm sure you're hungry all day long and you could, you're like a garbage disposal probably, yeah. but just eating good foods. And unfortunately there's not really, I mean, outside of my knowledge, there's not really a way to definitively increase your height beyond what your, what your genetics say, aside yeah. from, you know, fueling your body with appropriate nutrients. And true story, Simon and anyone else watching, when I was 12 years old, I was five foot four. And I was like, and all my friends had started to grow. And I wasn't the shortest in my peer group, but I was in that lower percentile, right? And I remember going to the doctor and kind of bugging my mom. And my mom was actually a college basketball coach. And I remember bugging her about getting taller and growing. And when am I get taller? It's probably annoying. And I go to the doctors for like a, a sports physical. And I remember asking the doctor, it's funny that I don't remember his face. I just remember like 
his his jacket from like you know the chest down, and my mom say, yeah, he's real worried ab ab about when he's actually going to get hit his growth spurt and get taller. And what the doctor did, he had me stand against the chart. He like put the little thing in my ear and the nose and he looked at and he's like, you're going to be six foot two. And I was like, ah, oh, awesome. Oh, thanks doc. Yes. Good. Yes. Kim never thought about it again. I stand here today at five foot 10. I've never been taller than five foot 10 in my life. This is what I graduated high school at five foot 10. So that doctor was either a shitty doctor or he was just lying to me to appease a young man. Um, yeah. I only say this, Simon, because it's going to be difficult to outgrow your genetics per se. We all have a limiting capacity built in. There might be certain invasive medical treatments that can be considered that probably shouldn't be to improve height. Now, I don't know specifically, you might have some sort of, of hormonal issue. It might be a, a growth hormone issue. I would definitely, Simon, say, hey, go to your doctor and have the conversation and get a comprehensive diagnosis, including blood work analysis and see, maybe your pituitary is not producing growth hormone. What And I don't, you know, I'm no expert for sure, but I do know that HGH is a prescribed medicine for individuals that have a growth factor issue. That might be a thought, but outside of that, own it. Own it, my friend. Be who you are. Be what you are. Be the best at what you can be. Focus on proper posture, standing nice and tall at all times, lengthening good exercises, like do all the things you can do, but to actually have an impact on the, the growth of your bones. I don't know of any technique outside of ensuring. Now, to Lindsay's point, you can ensure you grow optimally based upon high net nutrient intake, the right foods at the right times, for sure. Having deficiencies could have a negative impact on your overall growth and development. So maximize all the factors within your control, but also speak with your doctor and, and get a comprehensive evaluation. Yeah, definitely. It's funny you mentioned the doctor. My younger brother and sister are twins. And uh, so like, they I don't know, they're like 14, I guess. They go to the doctor and he's like, yeah, you both are going to be about 6'2". And my brother's like, okay, cool. Yeah. And my younger sister was like, she played sports here and there, here and there, but it wasn't like her thing. Yeah. She was like, no, I cannot be six two. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be like this tall freak. And I don't like play basketball like I do and like all this stuff. So they grow up and now at how old are they? 25 years old. My brother is six foot seven. Wow. And my wow. sister, his twin is five foot nine. Oh, wow. So I'm like, did you stunt your growth intentionally? Cause that's what yeah. the doctor said. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. Six, seven, five foot nine. They don't even look like siblings. How about he got, he's like twins. He got all the genes. Yep. And yeah. I'm sure it's she's so happy weird. though. Yeah. Oh yeah. And how tall are you? You're six, two, six, two, six, two. All right. And that's like probably the, the perfect height for a tall female. Six foot seven might be a little too tall. Maybe. Yeah. He has to duck through doorways. So I'm glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a, a buddy who's six foot six and it's like, He's like, it's just a hassle, man. Oh, yeah. He can't buy like long sleeve shirts or hoodies are like up to here. Yeah. Uh, pants, you know. He's yeah, it's like 6'2 seems to be like that's like the perfect. It's like that's it's like they say, you know, they say like 5'10 to 6'2 for is like the, that sweet spot within the American culture. Right. Because mm -hmm. like things pretty much fit. Right. Like cars, like you can get in the car and like the seat moves back. It's like so your limb length is appropriate to like feed on the. I remember watching a, a documentary on, on kind of this where like foot pedal to like steering wheel ratio and the curvature of the seat is like made for like up to about six foot two, which is common in in this country. Anyway, I was going to say, I think I'm at the upper limit for sure. As for far sure. as clothing, cars, <laughs> but upper you can, limit. can you still like buy off the rack? In most places? Not like if I'm buying jeans or something like that, I have to order them like by inseam. Gotcha. Like custom talls or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, well, it's not a big deal. Slightly different, but the same is like I have a, like, I can't quite order off the rack most of the body sizes that I'm at simply because of like a, a neck to waist ratio. 
just doesn't like my neck size compared to my waist size is disproportionate. So like if it's if I wear a shirt that fits my neck, it's literally like a bell on me. Right. You know, so yeah. can't button the button. <laughs> no, I, I actually have to get those like um, they have collar extenders, which is like a little rubber band that stretches the collar. So kind of like elastic that, that goes in there. Right. But even then I got like a, a 21 inch neck, 20 and a half, maybe right now. Good luck finding a shirt that's a 19. Most most department stores, they stop at like a 17 and a half. Right. So even then it's like, I, and sometimes I'll like wear like a big, like I call it like an English knot. You see a lot of the Brits where there's like big, thick knots to cover up the space, to like cover the space. Exactly. So, and that like, I can like, I can fudge that. So I'm, I'm actually really good at tying knots. <laughs> so like, That's funny. Tie you do that. get a lot of neck compliments and questions. I, yeah, I know. Right. I was like, oh, I take that. And it's, that was more, not so much genetic, right. That was just, I think because of, of lifestyle training style sports style of course being a wrestler and i was getting my head pulled and pushed on but also that kind of like that blue i call it a blue collar mentality of strength training like everything like dumbbell curls were picked up off the floor it's like everything comes up off the floor that was just like old school gym i trained in barbell curls barbell starts on the floor you, you never you never fucking do a, a bicep exercise in a squat rack holy shit like you're gonna do bars, cool. Grab the barbell, put it on the floor, load it up, pick it up, boom, and then go from yeah, there, right? You get an extra rep. <laughs> you, you absolutely yeah. do. And that mentality, though, is I man, I freaking loved it. Um, all right, I think we're we've actually gone pretty long. I, this is a two-hour segment, Lindsay. Thank you for being here. I gotta go home and get some more girl time with my kids. Um, anyone, everyone, click the links below this video. By the way, if you want to work one-on-one -on -one with Lindsay, do a consultation with her would be amazing. Um, if you want to work with her on an eight-week personalized program where she becomes your personal registered dietitian, that is available. We have our online platform. We're giving you a twenty-five percent percent discount right now with promo code transform. Click that link below. Also join our YouTube text message list. There is a number down below that goes to me. Text me, text me the word YouTube. I will put you into my, my private group of YouTube friends and I will actually text you when new videos are coming out. I'll give you sneak peeks into some content or topics or ideas. I will ask you about certain videos you want us to post. And also we got some cool free giveaways. So definitely click that link below, send the text message. I will not spam you. You can like not be a part of it, but you know, just making it easier because YouTube has not done a good job in letting you know when these videos come out. I think that I think we might get shadow banned again after this video, by the way. But hey, what are you going to do? I don't care. We're going to speak the truth over here. Um, so we appreciate you guys for being here. Thank you, Lindsay. Anything before we go? I don't think so. Have an huh? awesome day. Catch some basketball games today. Ooh. Maryland women are playing tonight. I think oh. men are also playing. So, oh, big go day. Good. Good, good, good. Good to hear. Awesome. Well, pre always appreciate you, Lindsay. And everyone here, guys and gals, thank you for being a part of us. We will see you soon. Bye.